Hello everyone, Adam from Middle Age Gaming here, and today I'm going to be talking about Final Fantasy VII Rebirth's ending and what I think is really going on. So we're going to be talking about some theories here, and obviously there's going to be some spoilers as to what happens in the game. So if you really don't want to have those, if you want to kind of experience it for yourself, I would recommend subscribing right now so you can come back and visit us once you have played it and, you know, come back another time. But if you are not afraid of spoilers or you've already finished the game, then join me because this is what I think might be happening. So first of all, let's go over some of the older theories that people have been talking about. So one thing that people we thought after Remake might be possible is that this is a separate timelines issue. Maybe Sephiroth, uh, post-Advent Children, returned from the future. And then, you know, he has all his knowledge of what's going to happen. Uh, Aerith somehow gets that knowledge as well. And they have an idea of what's going to be happening in the future. And so this kind of causes kind of a... Back to the Future style, you know, split timeline where, you know, you still have the original going off in one direction, but then now we've created this entirely new timeline. So that was a pretty popular theory going around. A lot of people also thought that there might be some sort of multiverse kind of thing going on based on the different kind of stamps that we see. Uh, we have Beagle stamp in the main remake world, and then we also see like a, uh, what, there's a some kind of like border collie looking thing, and a bulldog, there's a, there's a whole bunch of them. So then some people were thinking that there might be kind of a multiverse going on. So there's actually multiple Final Fantasy VII's going on at the same time. And we're somehow crossing in between them or like crisscrossing and whatnot. And that is all possible, but I don't think that that is necessarily what's happening. I actually kind of wouldn't mind if that was. But um, given the evidence that we've seen, I think we might be getting something else here. So based on what we've seen, this is, this is part of the reason why I think this. For one, when we see the Zack scenes, Zack remembers that he was in front of all those general soldiers and that he should have died. He remembers that. And he specifically says that he basically felt like he was going to die and then for some odd reason ended up not. And then Biggs says the exact same thing. He says, you know, I felt like my soul was being taken out of me. So with those two things, they clearly remember what happened in our timeline. And so that would imply that these are not multiverses. Uh, also because Biggs has memories of Cloud. And Zack has memories of Cloud. But their memories are completely different. Zack's memories go up to the point where he was supposed to die. Biggs's memories are of past that point when, Jack, when Cloud joins Avalanche. So because of that, it seems like both Zack and Biggs are not from the same timeline, but have somehow been inserted into whatever world they are currently in, and they are actually from separate worlds. So that would imply that this is not kind of a multiverse thing where this is the way Zack always had been, and then this is a, an alternate version of Zack. It seems like this is the actual version of Zack, and the same with Biggs, because... If it was Zach's time, if it was a timeline where Zach survived, Cloud would have never become a mercenary, and then Biggs would have never met him. Yet Biggs knows Cloud, and he knows Cloud from his own timeline. So clearly, they are not from this timeline, or at least one of them is not from this timeline, and then the other one was. Or what I think is probably more likely is that both of them are not from wherever this world is, and were inserted here. So that leads to a lot of questions. And my first thought was this is some sort of lost kind of thing, you know, where they're all in purgatory, uh, you know, they're secretly dead or whatever. And, you know, that would have made sense. But then, of course, we see Elmira, we see Marlene, and I'm thinking, oh, did they really change that? Did they die when the plate fell? Because we didn't see them after the plate fell in Remake. So, you know, we saw them evacuated, but we didn't see what happened afterwards. So at first I was like, oh no, this is a major departure, right? If we are in some sort of uh, limbo, this is a big difference. But then we see Kyrie, and we see Kyrie in side quests, and the same with Johnny. So we know that they are alive, and yet they are also in this world. So the fact that they can be there is a little bit confusing. Also, it's kind of odd because Marlene still seems to have her visions of the future that she got when she touched Aerith, whereas Aerith and Red 13 seem to have lost those memories after the destruction of fate. So it seems like at least this version of Marlene, her memories were not erased. I'm not quite sure why that is. I have some theories, but uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um... But yeah, so then I thought, okay, well, maybe this isn't actually Marlene. Maybe this is just the planet's manifestation. Maybe it is still Limbo, and this is not Marlene, but this is actually the planet, and it is basically personifying 
itself as Marlene in order to communicate with these characters. But then she still acts like Marlene. She still acts like a small child. She doesn't have that kind of creepy, you know, knowing child vibe. She still seems like a very small child. So I do think it is actually Marlene and not the planet. So I, I do feel that that's that. But then how can this all happen? Well, I think what's going on here is we're getting a kind of bubble world. And that's what I'm going to call it. I'm going to call it a bubble world. You can call it a box world. You can call it a Schrodinger's cat world. Um, but basically, that's what it is. And when I say that, what I'm saying is, if you're familiar with Schrodinger's cat, right? You have the cat. It's in the box. It's both alive and dead until somebody observes it, right? But until that point, it's existing in both states simultaneously. And I think that that's kind of what we're getting here is the planet has created two versions of reality that exist simultaneously, but we can only observe theoretically one at a time, with the exception of later on, you know, it looks like people are being able to simultaneously uh, view these two different worlds. But that's what I think was happening. And the reason I think this is basically all because of what Sephiroth says uh, when Cloud is, you know, in Aerith fall at the Temple of the Ancients. He says, when the boundaries of fate are breached, new worlds are born. Some quickly perish while others endure. Yet even the most resilient worlds are doomed to fade but it's not death, it's a homecoming. So what I think Sephiroth is saying here is that basically when you have somebody who defies fate and they decide, you know, they, they, they try to do something that's not the planet's plan. So the planet does have a plan. It has this fate. That's the whole thing we were going on about in Remake, right? But when people challenge that, then the planet basically, because it can't control people. People have free will. So the planet, in order to control fate, imagine a river or a stream, a life stream per se, and it's flowing along. And as this river gets to a certain point, you know, the, the planet wants to go in one direction, but, you know, the person who is, you know, sailing a boat or whatever on this, they want to go in a different direction. So what the planet does is it basically creates two copies of the same world. You know, there's the real world and there's this copy world. The person exists in both worlds. So basically, it's kind of like Schrodinger's cat, right? You're one. You're making one of two choices. You can go left or right. And so the planet, you know, wants you to go left. You want to go right. So the planet's like, okay, we're going to split reality here. In one reality, you go left. And in the other reality, you go right, right? But then after it, these two worlds are split, it quarters off or sections off this bubble world, the, the world of what you wanted, not what it wanted. It sections that world off. And then collapses it and destroys it. And then that world returns to, you know, all that energy returns to the life stream. And by doing this, it gives you kind of this illusion of free will because you can choose which direction you want to go in. But because it's splitting you in that, you know, both both worlds exist and then it collapses the one it doesn't want. It maintains that fate is going to work the way it wants. So it's going to maintain this world. And I think that that's kind of what it seems like is going on here. So when the team say, okay, you know, we're going to do this or we're going to do that, if the planet's okay with it, it just lets the life, you know, just lets the stream go on the way it's supposed to go. And if the planet doesn't like it, then what it does is says, okay, we'll just split here. You know, we'll just create two realities, one where you go your way, one where you, you know, one where you go the other way. And then later on down the line, I'll collapse the one where you went the other way. So you're going to go the way I want. And I think that's kind of what's going on here or what might be kind of going on here. So if we're going back to remake, we can go back to when we fought fate and we destroyed fate. But we didn't actually destroy it because the whispers are still clearly here. And we still clearly have and now we have two kinds of whispers. Now, that might just be kind of a uh, thematic thing. It might just be an artistic choice to have two colors so we can differentiate which ones are there on the side of the planet and which ones are on the side of Sephiroth. But it does seem like they have two different roles. The white whispers are often associated with this almost like rainbow light. So when we see them, we kind of see this rainbow light. And we see that all throughout Rebirth. We see that right before Zack is supposed to die, we see that right around when Biggs is supposed to die. We see it when Zack is going to choose, you know, he's riding his motorcycle and he's going to choose Cloud. And we also see it a lot of times when Aerith is like stepping through to the different dimensions. So we see this rainbow light and it's often associated with the white whispers, not the black ones or the gray ones. 
And so what I think is happening here is I think these two whispers actually have different roles. And what Sephiroth wanted is he just wanted the one kind of whisper, and that's why we only saw that one in Remake. So what I think these two things are is I think the white whispers are involved with creating these bubble worlds and also being able to move between them. Uh, so, you know, they're the ones that are able to split fate and by able, you know, by splitting it, they're able to kind of move between these two realities. And I think the black ones are supposed to collapse it. I think it's their job to collapse these two worlds back into one. So collapse the one reality, they go back into one big river and then, you know, it, and then that's the, the fate that the planet wanted. So I think that that was their role. And I think that's because, A, like I said, the white ones are often seen with this light that's associated with these alternate realities, but also because Sephiroth keeps talking about a homecoming. He keeps talking about reunion, which, of course, in the original meant something completely different. But here it seems like, you know, he's, he seems that he wants the planet to be whole. And so by that, I think what he means is he wants all these separate realities to collapse into one reality. And because when the planet creates these separate realities, then it can kind of section off parts of the life stream. And if things don't go the way it wants them to, then it can collapse the world it doesn't want. And then that way it can kind of always get what it wants. But if Sephiroth wants the world, he has to make sure that the reality that he gets is the reality that he wants. And the only way to do that is to collapse these realities into the, you know, what they can still split. That's fine with him, but they have to collapse into the direction that he wants. So I think he wanted the dark ones because they're in charge of basically they're, they're like the death of these worlds and they collapse, uh, you know, these worlds into the live stream and then report it back. So I think that's why he wanted those ones because he doesn't really care if the planet creates new realities. That's fine. He wants a different reality, right? He wants to win this time. But he wants to control which reality is the true reality or the canon reality that's going to survive. And so that's why he needed the black ones and he didn't necessarily need the white ones. But of course, Aerith then gets a control over the white ones. Those are one of the planets have. So they can still create these new possibilities. So I think that that's why we did that. Now, again, it could just be a thematic thing. It could just be, you know, in the original one. Um, they just were had the whispers and they're like, okay, well, we need to differentiate so people know which ones are good and which ones are evil and all that. That's definitely a possibility. Um, there are definitely other things in this game that kind of give me the impression that maybe they're making it up as they go along and they don't necessarily have a great plan of what's happening. Uh, and this might be evidence of that. It might very much be they were like, okay, we like this idea of fighting fate. Oh no, we need to do this. Okay, well, let's just add two colors. Um, that, that could be a sign that there's um, maybe... There's not as much of a plan as we would like there to be. But um, but yeah, so that's me basically thinking of some kind of justification for why they're doing that. So some evidence of that might be, you know, for instance, like we said, what Sephiroth just said, the, the world is being created in these multiple realities and we're seeing them all. That's one example. Another thing that makes me think that is that when Zack has to make a choice, does he go save Biggs or does he go to look for Hojo to help? cloud we see him in the tunnel and he chooses to go after cloud and he goes down the tunnel and then immediately we see that rainbow light in the opposite tunnel and so to me that would symbolize the creation of another split you know a creation of another world so in one world he goes to save cloud and the other world he goes to save biggs and i think that that is again reflected because then later we see him at shinra tower facing off against all these shinra soldiers but then later we see him at the Maker Reactor with Biggs. And so that could be, it could be that he made it to Shinra Tower and then turned around. And then after he defeated everybody, he went back to Biggs. But what he was trying to do at Shinra Tower was he was looking for Hojo and he was so that he could try to figure out what was going on with Cloud. So, you know, it would make sense that he got there, he fights all these people. Why would he just turn around? Wouldn't, wouldn't he try to go up the tower and look for Hojo? And that should be a whole big thing in itself, right? So him just turning around doesn't make a lot of sense. However, if the planet, again, even from within these bubble worlds, created even variations of that, then that might make a little bit more sense. You know, so basically every single time you think you have a choice, the planet is basically creating a Schrodinger's cat situation. But in reverse, where you have instead of having, you know, two worlds collapsing into one, you're having one world that splits into two. And then later on, it'll collapse them back down into one. And yeah, so he goes to save Big. So I think the fact that we see him at Shinra Tower and then very shortly after see him at the Maker Reactor, 
would imply that to me. And then also, of course, this whole thing about how Sephiroth says these worlds are destroyed. Uh, people keep talking about in the bubble world how it's you know how it's going to collapse, how the world is ending. Biggs even comments that there's no Mako left in the reactor. Uh, so you know, I think the planet's pulling all of the life stream. It's pulling all the Mako out of the uh, out of that world, and so there's none left. And then it will shift all that back into the real world, you know, or back into the life stream wherever it needs to be. Um, so because of that, I think that this is kind of you know it makes sense. Now, is this 100% what's going on? I can't say. It could still be alternate timelines. It could still be uh, a multiverse situation. Uh, and ad admittedly, there is a lot of evidence that kind of suggests that maybe they don't have too great of a plan of what's going on. So maybe Square Enix doesn't even know. Uh, part of that is, like I said, they have, you know, the, the fact that we only saw one kind of whisper and suddenly now we're seeing two different kinds of whispers. Um, another one would be the whole thing about, you know, we saved uh, Wedge. Wedge was alive. And then in a side quest, we're kind of told it's not exactly off screen, but it's basically an off screen death, right? They said, you know, oh, almost immediately after you saw him, he fell out the window and died. And that just seems kind of anticlimactic. Like, oh, we wrote this to change all of it. And then we just, we're just going to end the character anyway. And then we're just going to kind of tell you about it. And then oddly enough, it's not even like one of those things in comic books or whatever, where they tell you, like, if you don't see the body, you know, the person's still alive. No, we see him fall and it's like a flashback scene. So it, it just seems very anticlimactic. And it seems like a very big waste of something you set up. But not only that, like they do the same thing with Biggs too, right? Like we, we see Biggs survive and then, you know, he goes to the macro reactor and then he's basically just executed immediately. And it's like, okay, well, he's gone too. So it seems like they're setting up these, you know, big twists and then they're just kind of like anticlimactically like, eh, whatever, you know, th these characters are, are, they are actually dead. It's, it's whatever, forget about it. So to me, that is kind of, it kind of shows that maybe there's not a great plan going on. Also, the whole thing about, you know, Aerith loses her memories, Red 13 loses his memories, but Marlene still remembers somehow. Now, this could be that the Marlene in our world did lose her memories. It's just this, for whatever reason, within this bubble world, you know, things were maintained. So she maintained her memories in this bubble reality, but the Marlene in our world does not remember. That's a possibility. Um, I've heard, I've seen people saying online that maybe Aerith does, in fact, still remember, but she's kind of faking it. Uh, so... Yeah, I don't know, but Red seems to definitely have lost his memory. So I don't really know what's going on with all that. Um, yeah, but then again, this kind of, and then this idea, kind of pulling it all around at the end, right? There's the whole thing about, you know, Sephiroth comes down. Does he kill Aerith? No, he doesn't. Cloud blocks it. Yes, he did. Aerith's dead. Cloud sees her alive. He's talking to her. Cloud's holding a dead, bleeding body. How is that possible? Is he hallucinating? Now, there's definitely the possibility that Genova is just messing with his head, and this is all just a big mind language. But, uh, but another possibility is is that you know the world split in one, in one reality. Cloud did save Aerith. That's the one that's alive. That's the one that we can see. That's the one that is walking around and and helps him out in the in the end. But then the Aerith of our path is dead. So there's a living Aerith in a different one of these realities. And then there's our Aerith and our reality. But because Aerith has now gained the power of the planet, she's able to kind of, you know, crisscross and mishmash and whatever she wants. So now she is able to, you know, so even if the planet does collapse whichever reality she was in, it doesn't really matter because now she has the white uh, whispers at her disposal and she can pass along to whichever reality she wants. So anyway, that's my theory. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of holes in it. I'm sure you guys can point out plenty of holes in it. Uh, if so, if you have any holes or if you see anything and you're like, no, that's not even totally possible, you know, let us know in the comments. If you agree and you're like, hmm, you know, this is right. Or if you can think of other examples that maybe kind of fortify this, let us know that too. You know, I'm really curious. I'd really love to discuss these things with you guys. And I, I'm really excited to look at some of these possibilities. And it might be a few, fair few years before we get part three. So until then, Basically, all we have is theories. So let us know what you know. Let us know what you think in the comments and like and subscribe. And yeah, I well, hope to see you guys again soon. Bye bye.